Hello and welcome to Cosmic Convos on creativity, spirit, and consciousness, sponsored by iCreateDaily.com. I'm your host, Leora Alderson. Okay. Hello, this is Leora Alderson, and welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, Conversations for Kindling Creativity for Anyone in Pursuit of the Creative Life. Our guest today is Gloria Karpinski, a holistic counselor, spiritual director, teacher, and author. Her seminars, as well as her individual life attunements, integrate universal spiritual principles with everyday life for greater holistic balance. In her earlier life, Gloria graduated from the University of North Carolina, followed by working as a journalist prior to her ordination with the Interfaith Church, International Church of Ageless Wisdom. Gloria has presented and conducted workshops and seminars internationally for such diverse groups as psychotherapists, actors, and doctors in venues ranging from large conferences to colleges, churches, hospitals, and specialized groups. Gloria is also on the National Advisory Board of the Sophia Institute in Charleston, South Carolina, and maintains a counseling practice in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. A published author of two books with possibly a third out by the end of this year, Gloria's first two books have been used as text for interfaith seminaries and study groups, including the Center for Sacred Studies in California, where Gloria is on the online teaching staff. Those fabulously titled books are Where Two Worlds Touch, Spiritual Rites of Passage, and Barefoot on Holy Ground, 12 Lessons in Spiritual Craftsmanship, of particular interest to share because it might also help creators in our audience glean alternative opportunities for funding for their work. Gloria's accolades include a grant from the Lawrence D. Rockefeller Fund for the Advancement of the Human Spirit and a grant from the Blessing Project Foundation in Winston-Salem, North Carolina to produce her book for Two Worlds Touch into a CD package. This package is now available in her online store at GloriaKarpinski.com, along with several meditation CDs recorded by Gloria, which all of which, of course, the links to which will be in the show notes of this episode on iCreateDailyPodcast.com. Welcome, holistic counselor, Gloria Karpinski. Thank you so much, Leona. It's a pleasure to be with you. I have been hearing about you for years, and we were just saying prior to starting uh, the show that it, it's a shame. I can't believe that we've lived near each other in the same city for so many years, but for whatever reason. But as you were also indicating earlier, you know, we also tend to go with the flow of the universe. And, you know, there are reasons and things happen when they're supposed to happen. And I'm so grateful that for us, it's happening to meet now uh, in this venue. And so am, I. So am I. Thank you so much for inviting me. I tend to believe people will meet in the right time, and so here we are. <laughs> right, and, and your work, as, pe as people will, will begin to hear as you share your story, they'll understand all the more why that's true for you. So take us back just a little bit to how it is that your spiritual creative journey became essentially your life work. You, you yes. know, from the university to journalism, and then what happened? <laughs> or wherever you want to start. Well, I guess I really honestly have to start in childhood because of the fact that I was always intuitive as a child, a clairvoyant, some would say. At least I saw pictures in my head from the time I was a little kid. And I always was drawn to the spirit um, and I couldn't stay away from the church, but I also started questioning. I was one of those kids that started asking questions that uh, the adults found hard to answer. So a quest for what are we doing here? Why are we here? How do we grow? <laughs> All of those things started motivating me very young. But I mean, I was a, I don't mean I was a little spacey kid because I wasn't, I was actually very grounded, which I'm grateful for, I must say. Yes. Know? And really stress that grounded part when I'm working with clients and students, because I think it's so important for all of us you know, to yeah. keep our feet on the ground as well as no, uh, yeah. you know, our I inspiration in the cosmos, so to speak. But anyway, from that, I, the time I got to college, I was starting to get some the kind of information I wanted from studying different religions and different traditions, including uh, psychology and vari variations of that in all kinds of different ways. And um, so it, life goes on, life goes on. And I, you know, as you pointed out, I was a journalist, I had children. So I was busy with all of that and then 
in my third, but in the meantime, I was always, always studying spirituality and always wanting to know the ways we grow. And in that, back in a certain period of time, that took me into a lot of human potential movement, you know, and feminist movements and conscious racing movements and therapies of every kind, all of which I am so grateful for because, you know, the great mandate is know thyself. And any one of those things and all of those things are fed into my understanding, at least some aspects of myself better. Yeah. So the circumstances in my life were such that at a certain point, I was able to concentrate on my studies. And I said that I, to what I perceived the divine to be at that time, uh, is whatever I have, you have. What do you want me to do? And I didn't expect healing work. That, was, that came quite as a surprise. Um, and then the, some healing work, I was trained a lot to look for causation, start looking for uh, how, how do we create these patterns because we're always creating, you know. And from the healing work, I started doing the counseling and from the counseling, the healing work has never been a way I earned a living, but it was my great educator beyond anything else, <laughs> I think. And maybe I should say the integration of everything else took place in the healing work, where I was able to see working with people, um, how, how their patterns, psychologically, spiritually, with their consciousness, with their creativity, how it manifested. And, and, and sometimes in illnesses, you know. And um, anyway, from that work, uh, people started asking me to do the one-on-one -on -one, um, readings. So I started doing the in-depth work. So the healing work has continued to be a tithe, really. And as I said, um, my great educator, for which I am very, very grateful. So but my, I started earning my living <laughs> by doing the in-depth readings. And from the in-depth readings, it was a natural progression to start teaching. And then from teaching, you know, doing lectures and teachings. And, and that started off locally and moved uh, nationally and to different places and um, then internationally. And, uh, you know, I do, I do want to say this because I think it might be interesting to, to anyone listening that's developing their own creativity and saying yes to their own uh, mandate, um, is that um, most of those invitations too, I never initiated. Mm. They came as a result of saying yes. <laughs> If I could put it that saying, saying yes to following your heart where your heart and intuition exactly. were leading you. Exactly. Loving that. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Nice. And sometimes things take a long time to get where they're going to. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, I always knew writing would be part of it because I've been a journalist. And I, well, I just always knew that writing would come. But it was years into the work before it did. Right. So, so. Can I go back to your childhood for just a moment when you said you were always, you were seeing visions and, and having um, spiritual experiences perhaps, and just certainly a, a spiritual inclination. Did you have anyone in your life and your family, your parents, whatever, who were there to sort of guide you and understand what you were experiencing as a child? Well, that's a very interesting question because I just wrote a chapter in my new book about children and the importance of, uh, I have a, uh, the last chapter in this new book is called uh, Becoming an Ancestor. And one of the things in there is about the legacy for children, you know, mm -hmm. and I think the children now coming in, let me just back into this question this way. Mm -hmm. I think the children coming in now are so tuned in and so ready to be taught, you know, that we have a real responsibility as well as a pleasure to work with them. Uh, the answer to your question is no, not really. It doesn't mean I didn't have kind people around me. And I think a, a lot of them loved Jesus. But if I ask any of the difficult questions about Jesus, it was sort of dismissed, you know. And of course, I didn't have the scholarship or um, knowledge in any way to be able to frame it in different ways. I will say this. When I was about 11, I had a, a uncle who was a Baptist minister. And he didn't know what answer my questions, but he sent me home with theology books. <laughs> now, I'm 11 and 12 years old. I don't understand a word in either one of them. But I have looked back on that and, 
and so appreciated that he honored my questions mm -hmm. because that wasn't happening at church, quite frankly. Interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a blessing. Another one of those little, <laughs> angels, yeah, an angel along the way guiding you. Yes, and, and let me say this also, uh, the fact that I was seeing a lot of pictures in my head, that was just a natural part of life. And I don't think children question, do you see pictures in your head? <laughs> right. Yeah. I think they just assume you do, you know? Right. Like, you don't ask, does blue look like blue to you? Right, right. You, know? you don't know that what others aren't not seeing or exactly, not seeing. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, we were middle of the normal childhood stuff, you know? So, yeah. right. So, okay. So when did you begin? And well, first of all, maybe you could explain a little bit about life intensives. Mm -hmm. that the life intensives? Yes. What is it? Your, the readings that you do, um, oh, okay. because you do the holistic counseling, you said you don't usually like that doesn't earn a living for you. So the healing work, so to speak, but then you also do, sorry, life attunements. And um, classes and yes. And teaching yeah. both of those. The life attunements, um, are, are moving into a person's energy field to go to causation level to understand what is motive, helping them, offering them whatever I see um, for their consideration, you know, because I'm very clear that people are the authorities on their own life. Mm. But I also know the law of attraction is also working. So I know that we attract people, you know, into our energy field for one reason or another. Yes. You know, even if it's just to dis dismiss what they said. Yes. <laughs> uh, but um, it takes a long time. These are not short, little quick psychic, so-called psychic readings. It does use those abilities, but hopefully it uses some intelligence too, I hope. <laughs> you know. But we're looking to say, how can they manifest their, uh, their inner directive? That's the main thing. And I'm just, mainly, how do we empower each other? Yes. That's one of the things I'm really passionate about is helping people tap into the, the inner reservoir of yes. wisdom that we each have and that through conditioning and what have you um, that yes. we work with and forget that we actually have access to. So I love that you're doing that work. How did that start for you? Were you just people coming to you uh, for advice? Were you, um, how did you start the teaching work? Well, um... It started, you know, again, like I, I, I repeat, I, I didn't do anything except just I was doing healing work. And then I remember um, the first reading I ever had was with a gentleman who I had done healing work for his family. And he said to me, do you think that you could uh, do this work psychically for me? And just as a, and, you know, as a reading, and I said, I don't know, I have no idea. And so I did, and that was a way of spirit teaching me to say, yes, you can mm -hmm. take this to the next step, you know. So, and then, you know, I think a lot of what happens is that once we say yes, we start setting up a magnet. And if we're doing things that are in integrity, that we draw to us what we need, Yes. Um, and, and the contacts we need and the people and so forth. And then, and then I do think in this kind of work that uh, word of mouth is a lot of what makes a difference, you know. Yes. yes. And well, how did you come to be doing the healing work in the first place, such as for his family? Well, that is a story. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you that story if you like. Yeah, we love to. Uh, yes, because uh, it was pretty dramatic, I must say. Okay. I sat down one day, and this was in the 70s. I sat down to do a meditation, just a normal meditation, if there is such a thing. And then I sat down to do it, and this energy entered my body. I wasn't alarmed because I was in the habit of praying always before I meditated. So I was very, very clear I was not interested in hanging out or getting information from anything that didn't serve the highest and the purest. That was absolutely my dedication to the beginning, and I encourage that on anybody. Be absolutely clear about that, you know. But it was a very dramatic energy, and it just sort of moved throughout my body, and suddenly someone I knew's back was in front of me, and uh, my hands knew what to do with this back, and um, I knew what had caused it, so, and, and it was a knowing, you know, it just came in the way that intuition does and the way that psychic impressions do. And um, 
So that was done. And after it was over, um, it was like, what in the world happened to me? You know, oh. what was this, you know? And so it happened another time or two. And, um, and I was getting used to the way it felt, but I didn't know what to do with it. I had no idea what to do with it. And someone said, well, you know, there's a man over in Mooresville that sounds like he does this kind of work. And I called him up and he asked me a few questions. And then he said, well, why don't you come over here next Tuesday? And, um, and I watched him work and it appears like a pantomime you know, because we're seeing, he's seeing, and then later me, um, energies that if someone's not sensitive to that, they might not even see it, you know. <laughs> that was the way it started. Um, all healing work, there's so many variations of healing work, including just being really conscious of a healing vibration being sent to someone. So I don't want to limit this to just this kind of practice, but that is the way it started. And so I went to him every Tuesday for three months. And then like a good teacher, he kicked me out and said, <laughs> as well as I can. And, <laughs> I and that. by that time, you know, I was hearing from a lot of people and one thing led to another, you yeah. know, like that. So what, what, what is the primary nature of the healing work you do now? Is it, um, is it in person? Is it, um, or do you do it uh, like live situations, like face-to-face -face like this over the internet? How does it work for you? No, the, it's by request. The people, people request it. And I put, the first thing that happens is they go to uh, my altar and then they go into my prayer work. And I learned to know that those steps I went through was part of my training to know that healing at a distance is possible. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go to the same steps that I did before. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the way that works. Yeah. And the other kind of work comes through people contacting my office, you know. And people do, they, they send emails or they telephone or, you know, whatever for the request for. There's such a need for this level of healing these days, yes. especially because the, the fast pace of everything, you know, at, yes. at, at, at times in eras such as we are in, you know, where yes. everything's, uh, there's a quickening of everything. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and as well as the confusion, the inflammation, the... Um, overwhelm um, the stress that comes with trying to keep up with it all while yeah. at the same time, you know, opening to, you know, or, or wanting to open to one's own um, growth, spiritual growth and okay. core and balance and all of that. So I would imagine that, you know, you're as busy now as ever and are very much needed work. Yes. And I think that it, I think to your point exactly uh, is that we're in an evolutionary turning and it's and we are in several generations here that are the transition. Mm -hmm. All of the 20th and all of the 21st century, we're involved in this. And so the very all the institutions are under challenge. Yes. The very air we inhale <laughs> is filled with a lot of people's fears and mm -hmm. uh, thought forms in either case, all the things they're creating because we're made in the image of the divine and that's a literal statement. So we're always creating. We're always creating. And so when people are creating out of fear, then that's in the atmosphere and so forth. So it becomes imperative to find the spiritual practices, I think, that work for you. You know, right. the, the things that can keep you balanced and, and feeling whole yes. and, and so forth. Yeah. yeah, to stabilize and anchor, you know, you within a, a central core that's not so easily swayed into the zones of fear that are so prevalent and uh, the symbols that came to mind as you were talking related to the internet and the media and how there's so much about fear flying yeah. through the airwaves, you know, of the media. And that's why I've basically, I don't tune into any news. Um, and what I've come to realize is that, um, well, I, having spent months away in India um, and for a period of time where at that time it wasn't easy, easy to access like the U.S. channels, and so away, being away for three months, basically without any, you know, U.S. news and TV uh, stations and what have you, coming back, turning it on, it realized that it was the same thing. You know, it's like the same talking heads, the same fear, the same shock, the same, you know, and nothing changed and life goes on. And that 
my knowing about something that I could not affect or change was not helping the world. But what was is me work taking care of my life and those around me uh, through taking care of my life and my own spirituality and balance and stability that for me to get caught up in the external fears does not serve. It just sends me in a whirlwind <laughs> turmoil. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, early in my training with spirit, because I began working with frequencies in spirit and got an intelligences and in other frequencies and uh, guidance. And, uh, and a lot of my guidance in the beginning was observe, but don't energize. And so it's possible to turn on the news. It's possible to walk in a world and, and be aware with your neighbors and your friends and family members and so forth, that they are expressing a lot of fears and this, that, and the other. And the more that you can uh, observe that and just not choose, and choose, operative word, choose, <laughs> choose not to energize it. I think that that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to fo and to focus on there's so many to, when you focus what we focus on grows and so to focus on the positive, the good, and the gra with gratitude, the things that we can um, can affect positively, and to make sure that we are that positive light and force in the world as you do with your healing work and such. Yeah, and I think the more that we know ourselves, I mean that's the first great directive is to know thyself. So I think the more that we know that we're spiritual beings. And then to the studies that we can do can help, can teach us the various ways that can manifest. And, and there are certain, no matter what religion you follow, mm -hmm. or if you don't, um, or tradition or training or whatever, they are commonalities. And, and some of them, I would say, come right straight out of understanding that we're all creators. And there's no way not to create. I mean, as soon as you get that, you, then the decision becomes, do I want to be a conscious creator? Yes. Because if I'm alive, I'm creating. If I'm, if I'm thinking, I'm creating. Yes. And if I'm speaking or, or, or every action I do. And um, so when, it, when that's driven by a consciousness that says, I don't have to react, I can have to act out of this place in yes. me yes. that understands that I have responsibility for what I create and I can create that. I don't have to be reactive to, just as you're saying, to right. the negativity. It, it takes a lot of, I think it takes skills. It's one of the reasons that I named the subtitle on my second book, 12 Lessons of Spiritual Craftsmanship, mm -hmm. is because I think sometimes we can go through the romance of thinking that if I've read it and I believe it, you know what I mean, as a concept, yeah. that it's a done deed. And no, it isn't. There's yeah. a craftsmanship to bring all that in practice. Oh, it's such a good point. It, it's, it's reminiscent of we have in our audience a lot of writers and painters, uh, artists, that sort of thing. And, and it, yes, it would be like saying, because I want to uh, paint or and think about painting and know the concept of what I want to create, that I can. And it isn't to you. It's like anything else. Any, anything else that we want to do and do well um, and to anchor in our life requires practice and conscious application. So that's a good point. And I do think this is where we, this is where we find that we just have a myriad of opportunities that come from different traditions. You know, I have practices that come from several directions that have become part of my everyday practice, you know. Uh, and which I think is another point I would like to make here is that is that it's important for any of us to to um, search through uh, the techniques that are shown to us because not every it, one size does not fit all Definitely. and to sort out and find those things that help you stay on your own center. You know, what did they do it like I, 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 I personally like mantras. You know, yeah. they really do it for me. I wear a prayer bracelet that I never take off. Mm -hmm. do, do you know, I keep little things around that remind me. So when I glance at them, that they remind me, you know. Uh, but those things work for me, you know. But I would say to anybody, find, find those things that when you do them, they keep you on center or they remind you or they bring you back to center. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, focusing mechanisms, absolutely. So speaking of that sort of thing, um, and we've talked about psychic readings and intuitive um, uh, readings. So do you consciously work? Is, is there a difference in your mind between psychic and intuitive? Well, that's an interesting question. I think it's semantics as much as anything. 
I think that words, that words that get loaded with all kind of projections. And I think intuitive carries a, a, a projection that most intelligent people are comfortable with better than they are psychic. <laughs> you know, it's almost like psychic carries out, oh, does this mean, you know, woo-woo, as they say, <laughs> off somewhere. Everybody has intuitive abilities. It's just the degree to which they have acknowledged it or uh, they name it. Maybe they don't name it as such, you know. Right. Well, for you, uh, so, so being the teacher, being the, the intuitive the psychic mm -hmm. counselor and such, um, how are you do you still also have a mentor or a spiritual advisor that you seek out or have in the past? Or are you able to basically download your own solutions most of the time, if not exclusively? Well, I work with, uh, with some teachers in spirit and, um, and I, 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 I'll tell you, this is the truth. I feel that all, Oh, I'm sorry, you know what that is? <laughs> is, it, is it your phone or a bird? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a bird that's on my wall. I have, I have a clock here <laughs> in my office that um, on the hour tweets a bird. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I did get my cats. I, my, my assistant, who usually sits by my computer, is four-legged and furred. And I did move her out because I didn't think you'd particularly want to hear what she had to say. Oh, we don't mind at all, but, but that was thoughtful of you. <laughs> what I started to say, though, and I sincerely mean this, um, I, I, have, I bow in gratitude for all the people through space and time that have preserved the great teachings. And I consider them my teachers. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and I honor them. I also have grown into the place that I see my clients as my teachers. Mm. You know, yeah. it's through them that I see how it works, how these principles work. You know, and I watch their transformation, sometimes awestruck at yeah. what people are capable of doing, you know. Yes. And then, you know, and then I'm always paying attention to who's doing what and, and loving to learn from whoever. I just was listening to a Greg Braden um, yes. interview recently and, uh, and thinking, wow, he's doing such an incredibly good job of bridging um, between science and spiritual science. Yes. And um, so my teachers are kind of everywhere in that sense, you know. Yeah. Uh, I can still relate to that. I um, I really like Greg Braden and also have been really following and enjoying Dr. Jill Dispenza's work um, more recently. Are you familiar with him as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would imagine. So some incredible healing work um, going on with him with him and the people he's serving yes. um, and there can I can I just say also that my experience has been that there's wonderful teachers everywhere yes. and that of course we tend to look to the ones that we know because either they've written books or they've gotten a lot of publicity or we've seen them on just like I mentioned we've seen them interviewed like I did Greg or something right. uh, but there are so many excellent teachers that are working in communities everywhere Oh, that's such a good point because it's such a good point, especially because you, so many of them are, they're unsung heroes. They're not, they may not be known because they don't have the marketing savvy or team or whatever, but, but they're not seeking it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not in their karma. Yeah, <laughs> you know. yeah absolutely. So many things, you yeah. know. Yeah. Well, along the lines of, and I think a lot of what, what I really also appreciate about what you're talking about, one of the things that we do a lot of is um, we host like art and creativity challenges using conceptual prompts, things like quotes and more conceptual concepts for creating, create around a concept or an idea. Because um, I have found for myself that that really helps to stretch my awareness, self-awareness, consciousness, and tapping yeah. into intu intuition as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and where was I going to go with that? I forgot my point. Um, oh, that, just that when you get into that rhythm, just like you can tune in to teachers and guides everywhere, you know, same thing with your own thoughts. You begin to see that even this quote or this excerpt or this person's message or this uh, speaker or interviewee's comment, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there are lessons in there and messages in there that we can take, absorb and expand into our own meaning. Absolutely, absolutely, and I, and and I think that's that several principles of energy that happen at one time, including the attraction. There's a reason yes. why those quotes have have attracted you, yes. or that yes. book, or that speaker, 
you know. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So when you were talking earlier about your experience, the, the story of how you started getting into doing the readings um, and that wonderful meditation and healing experience, what came to mind was the, the, the cloud of the universe. So it's like downloads from the universe in mm -hmm. a way. Um, so do you have any, or are, is there any part of that experience, that internal, more personal experience with guides or spiritual beings or soul or whatever that you can elaborate on that's not too personal for you to share with our audience? Like when you, uh, if you speak to an inner guide, would you be speaking to your soul or an angel or just, or is there a person, uh, a disembodied or, or otherwise uh, entity, you know, kind of thing. So any of those kind of tangible like a little bit of a tangible tangible concepts that that are okay for you to share because i know that that can be a very personal thing well it is very personal and there would be certainly certainly things that i'm not you know uh, would, would don't think would be appropriate for me to really get into that but it, it it is to say that um i've encountered a lot working with people because doing sessions with people uh I very often see their guides are the angels. Um, I've come to appreciate how much support we are getting mm. on this planet. I love that. Yeah. Uh, but the, but let me say this about guides and teachers. They're not going to come in and do it for you. Yes. They empower and support your choices. But we would never grow ourselves, you know. Right. It would be like a parent doing homework or something. Yes. <laughs> I, you know. Uh, and so I think it's important to know that about working with guides and teachers. Yeah, that's such a good point. I have encountered some really interesting things, but I only had one experience ever with a black magician. And that was in the first year of my work because I had to, uh, I had to be trained in how to handle negative energy. Mm. And um, it's a long story, so I won't take you through the whole story. Suffice it to say, he just got after me. And, and they're sending energy into my house and so forth and so on. And I didn't know what to do about it, you know. And um, actually the man I was working with said, oh, I think when I brought it to him, he said, oh, no, I don't think you should mess with this. It's just too dangerous. And then when I got off the phone with him, my own spirit guidance says, oh, yes, it's your responsibility. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Now, you know, I'm expecting at this point, because I'm young in the work, I'm thinking it's going to be elaborate instructions. I'm going to have to do all this fancy ritual or something. Pray for him. I said, what? <laughs> Pray for him. Yeah. That's it. Pray for him. I prayed for him night and day. Every, every day I prayed, it lifted and lifted the energy he was sending in the room. And I prayed for him so much. And someone that was in our group that was very sensitive herself and aware of all of this said about a year later, she saw him on the corner and she said he, he looked like he was lit up, you know. And I said, well, he ought to be you know, <laughs> for, all, for all of that. But um, it was a very interesting experience, and um, I've never forgotten that lesson, you know. I, that is so powerful because uh, what, you know, you're, I got chills as you were describing it because, um, again, you, you are combating negativity with positivity and love. And isn't that the lesson of Christ? Isn't that, you know, basically mm -hmm. the lesson of all spiritual traditions? Um, yes. It is love. I think it is. And, and I also feel, I, I must say here too, just as um, because I don't want to be misleading either. Um, yeah, we want to walk in love all the time. You know, I do think, by the way, we have to sort of take that inside to say, what do we mean when we say love? You know, uh, because there are so many different frequencies of love. And, you know, our language does not accommodate that. We say, I love potato chips. I love God. I love my dog. We say it all the same thing, you know. So what do we mean? It's a different frequency. There are there are languages that have that, you know, like in ancient Persian and ancient Sanskrit and so forth. Ninety plus words of love, each more subtle than the one before. Actually, I can tell you, my favorite one comes from the uh, Inuits, who have a love, who have a word for love that translates as. I love you, but I won't go seal hunting with you. <laughs> and I have laughed over that myself so many times. Thinking, I know people like that. I love them, but I'm not going seal hunting with them. What I was just going to say is love unconditionally, absolutely, 
that does not mean that we don't draw boundaries. Yes. And yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's, it's about love. It's not about acquiescence and, um, you know, just, uh, being a rug or whatever, you know, to, yes. to be walked upon, you stand your ground with, com with yeah. confidence and, um, and common sense. But at the same, you know, so for whatever, we've all had uh, places and people, people rather, who have injured us. And, you know, that what we recognize and grow to, to know is that holding resentments only uh, injures ourselves further and holds on to that. So, you know, we have to let it go and we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, by recognizing, by forgiving, uh, by loving, by being appreciative of, and recognizing that, you know, no human is perfect. And we're all, we all have things that we've done that we wish we hadn't have done or would do differently if we could have. Um, so to remember that. Well, and, and speaking to that, there, it is really important, this word release of letting go. Yes. And this is one of the things I can encourage everybody and anybody to do is to have a good technique for release and to practice it so much that your subconscious and your subconscious, all parts of you are in alignment with that. I use an altar of light because an altar is an archetype. Your subconscious knows what it means. It doesn't have to figure out what you're trying to do. Mm. You know, and light is the highest frequency we know anything about. So when you put something on an altar of light, it's like an offering. I'm offering this to the highest part of me to take care of. That's lovely. You know, to release and so forth. You know. Yeah. And for those who aren't settled or comfortable with a spiritual icon, uh, then that's a very universal one. Mm -hmm. well. It is. It's it absolutely is. Yeah. 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 Forgiveness is essential. Yes, you you have that reminds me of another icon. Let's see, um, you have on your YouTube channel, which of course we will link. Uh, see if I still have it up. Yes, here it is, an incredible video that's on uh, the intro of your YouTube channel page, um, spirituality and religion, the one and the many. It's beautifully produced. It's only it's just under four minutes, and it uses the metaphor. It takes people beautifully through the metaphor of water um, and spirit and, and, and the, the individual vessels. Would you like to say anything about that? Of course, I'll link to the video, but if there's anything about that you'd like to say, it's a wonderful oh, metaphor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I have loved, loved that distinction. And that was, that came from spirit uh, early on was um, when I was being trained. Um, very early on and it sort of dropped in my subconscious and stayed there and so years later we ended up um, doing doing the video um, it's that a lot of people have trouble defining the difference between religion and spirituality and um, so I was shown I was questioning that and I was shown water everywhere there was nowhere it was not um, and it was flowing ceaselessly and then I saw all these containers come along and some of them were tall and skinny, some were short and fat. So, you know, some were elaborate, some were very plain. All of them had some of the water. None of them had all of the water. And as long as they kept the stop, a stopper out of the top of the water, of the container, mm -hmm. then it, became, it was living water. But when they put a stopper on top of it, you know, it began to stagnate. And um, so it was very quickly that, that the spirituality is the flowing uh, water that's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that if we happen to have been raised in one culture or another, we've encountered that with this, that, or the other container. Yes. You know? And it may be living water. It may be the one that we need to drink from <laughs> all along if it's living water. But if it's all bound up about the container, that yeah. you have to believe everything about the container and the container is the only way. It's the only one that has the water. Then I think it's in risk of being toxic. Yes. And you say that's, uh, and it's such a wonderful metaphor. And you say in there as well about uh, so often people end up focusing on the container and the, at, which you mentioned just now. And as a result, they uh, lose sight of what they're really supposed to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is what's within the container. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. 
So um, share with us about your books a little bit and the process of writing and publishing those. Like how did you, you said you always knew you'd be writing. It just took longer than you thought. Uh, you have two out that are doing really well still as far as it, as it appears to be. Plus they've been used as basically study guides, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the process of how you started writing the first one? And then also, you know, up until now that, that got you to finally start writing the next one? Because it's been a number of years between each one, mm -hmm. but in particular mm -hmm. between the first two. Well, the, um, I got a call from the publisher, quite frankly, uh, who said, we'd like you to write a book for us. And um, that's how that happened. And the next thing I knew, I had an editor from Valentine sitting in my living room saying, oh. what do you want to write? You know. Oh. So that was a blessing. And again, it underlines this point that if we're just, if we are, if we're being true to ourselves and we're being true to what it is we believe we're here to do, that, um, that much, much is going on that will be wrong to us that isn't necessarily what we think we've put in motion with um, our manipulations and control. <laughs> yes. I had to tell you this because I think some of your listeners may like this. I once questioned in spirit the difference between control and no control. And uh, the answer came back, no sailor would go to sea that did not understand what his or her boat could do and how to navigate. But only a fool thinks they control the tide and the winds. Mm. So that a good ride was a surrender to the tide and the winds and then practicing the craftsmanship within it. So just using that, that uh, for a moment, I didn't have, I was just busy doing my, you know, tending to my boat. <laughs> yeah. And so the publisher came to me. I was very blessed with that. And I had I'm just an outstanding editor and she is who I'm working with now. She is just fabulous. And um, I'm a spirit, serious, spiritual student herself. Of, um, I once went with her with a practice at a Korean uh, facility in, in New York. Um, so that book is about, was based on a, a structure that I had been given in spirit about dynamics of change, mm. uh, seven steps of change. And so that's how that, that uh, book came, Where to Lost Touch. And that, that comes from, a, you know, from a roomy poem, mm. that line. Oh, lovely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the next book was kind of just a natural thing. And it was, I had been working and teaching for, for a long time. And one of the things I did do about before I wrote that book was, um, I have to tell you a little story because I think it might be really interesting to some sure. of your yeah. creators. Okay. Um, when I first discussed with my editor about writing she said, what do you want to write? And I said, well, I've been told in spirit that I will write a book called Barefoot on Holy Ground. And she got real quiet and she said, well, I think you will one day, but I think that you have to write another book first. She said, I'm maybe not ready to write the second. So I, I found myself saying to this woman, I had never met two hours before. You're right, you're absolutely right, you know. So, um, <laughs> We all come to each other in right timing to reflect what we need to hear, don't we? Anyway, so one of the things I did about writing Barefoot is that I set up a series of what I call discipleship forums. And I did groups of four to six people that were pretty committed people. And I did them all over the country. And um, what I did is I put the hard questions to them about walking consciously on the earth. And so I wanted to see how that, what, what it looked like with modern disciples, not ones that are still back in ashrams, you know, or maybe in monasteries and convents or mystery schools where a lot of us were trained, you know, along the way. Um, but what does it look like in modern, modern America, modern Europe? And um, so that was very confirming more than anything else to the principles that we all study. You know, how, what, what they looked like with arms and legs, you know. Right, right. That was, yeah, that was, that was very wise, and I think, I think to do that, and it must have given you a tremendous insight into how best to format the book to serve so many more people like those that were in those control groups, control groups, but study groups. 
Yeah, I went through a lot of sense of overwhelm too, you know. It was sort of like, I've got I've been accused of writing 12 books in one because yeah. of those 12, you know, different chapters. But I, I can remember sitting with just tons of material and thinking there's no way I'll make order of this. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a good point because uh, in working with social audiences that we have uh, and asking for people to give input or their thoughts on this or that, and then we'll compile them and create an article out of it. It sounded simple, but it actually is a lot harder. <laughs> it, is hard, yeah. it is to do that assimilation work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and call through it. Um, so, so then your second book. So that so you wrote the first book uh, through as a result of the study groups and such. So that took some time, and then you were free to write the next book. So tell us more about that. This new one. No, well, actually, so so you were first talking. You did the study group for where world where two worlds touch. Correct. Now the study group was pretty much off of principles I was teaching already in workshops uh, with the seven steps of change. And that was pretty much off that. And then I then I did some of the study group, the study groups I called discipleship forums. Okay. You know, between those two books, I was teaching a lot and traveling a great deal, you know. And um, yeah, then then came went to I mean um, barefoot on holy ground, and that's the one I did off the off of the a lot of the uh, forums. Right. Okay, I got it back. That's what I had been learning in the meantime. <laughs> right. Know? So could you give us an example of some of the hard questions or a hard question that you put out there to them originally? Well, well, let's say, gosh, that's been a while, but I would say that everything that you would imagine is challenging and every kind of question that you get from your, from your population that are, that are listening to your shows and so forth would probably be the kind, you could distill them down to the questions about, about commitment, about money, about managing uh, children and training them in an environment, dealing with all of the dynamics of change on this. One of the things I'm very, very dedicated to is the emergence of the divine feminine on planet Earth. I've been guided to understand from the very beginning of my work that it's the centerpiece mm -hmm. of this uh, new evolutionary turning. And out of it is gonna come you know, the work we need to do on this planet about the environment, for example, because that's very much about caretaking all species and the land and so forth. So we talked, so there was a lot of that kind of thing. How do, how do we, how do we shift systems? Mm -hmm. You know, if we are a banker or a lawyer or a candlestick maker, how, how do we consciously work within these systems and not see ourselves as above or removed from it, but rather an active part of creating um, a consciousness and affecting the people that work with us and for us, you know? Right. right. So well, there was a, just about every question you would think pragmatically. I guess if I had to sum it up, it would be the questions that would come up for, for a pragmatic visionary. Mm, that's a good term. That's very balanced. Um, and, and well, and it's so important because so many creators, they're, they're inspired by spirit, they're inspired by intuition, they're inspired from the light within them, essentially, and their higher selves, I think, because that's part of what career, where creativity comes from. And yet, then there's, then there's the day to day grind. So really, it's like, it's like we are angel and animal and you know the human being part <laughs> is, is, is synthesizing it's like where those two meet then that's where the consciousness yeah. is to help us to create more lightness within our being and can yeah. transform that right and so it's sort of like how do we do that if not but by applying the things that sound good that we think we believe as concepts in our life and actual practice which is you know which yeah. is the mundanity of it in a way but that's yeah. where it matters exactly. That's that's why I call the, the subtitle of that, um, you know, exactly that for Christmanship. Yes. Uh, because it does take practice. It takes yes. self-knowledge and it takes practice. Right, definitely. Um, okay, so then tell us about your third book that you're working on. And, and before you do, I just want to mention, so when we first connected, actually part of last year, like near maybe two thirds through last year, and you were, or even last summer, I think, and you were in a, such a busy traveling schedule, yeah. flying around the country and not internationally, um, doing and conducting workshops and retreats and that sort of thing. So tell us a little bit about your active teaching life now relative to your travels and teaching and workshops. Like, what does that look like for you in terms of what you're doing in the world, the work you're doing in the world? Well, <laughs> and I should do this in, in, in 24.
<laughs> Words are less, no doubt. Okay. Uh, I teach quite um, a variety of workshops. Um, it would be, you know, uh, in the whole spread of consciousness, I would say anything is, is up for ending up in a workshop. Um, I do a lot of four-day uh, workshops, what I call the intensives, as opposed to, let's say, a day workshop or something. I've also done um, a year-long program that I call Dakshina, which is a Sanskrit word. I use it in the concept of offering to God. And that was for, um, and I did quite a few of those. And um, yeah, and so I did works on the Divine Feminine, uh, on mystical Christianity, on uh, sacred service, just, you know, healing work right across the world, the different kind of groups, you know. Um, yeah, and this new, but I am going to start a mentorship program um, next fall. So I've had a lot of requests for that. So that'll be also something that goes on a year long program, you know. Um, the new book is a memoir. Or as, as my editor says, it's really a hybrid because it's also a teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's using the um, um, events and experience of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, in a real, you know, that's its reason to be. Right. It's, it's called Blossoms of Fire. Mm. And it comes from, uh, that's a line from uh, Robert wow. Pike. Poem. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I stepped on your words. That's a line from what? Uh, but, uh, from a Robert uh, Wright poem. Oh, it's such, so beautiful. You're so good with coming up with the titles. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, but that book is in process and, and it's not comfortable to really talk about a lot of it while it's still in process. I mean, I'll, I can say it's a memoir, you know, and um, it's taken me right back to my childhood and through all of these, some of the things we talked about uh, so far and, and, and other things. And um, yeah, so I'm hoping, you know, one of the things about, uh, that's been about my path has been to not be under the auspices of a university or a college mm. uh, and not working out of a center. So, you know, that has had its challenges, of course, but it's also had a freedom because there's no one telling me what I can or can't do, right. that kind of thing. But I think that there are people along the way, I know there are, that I get asked often, how in the world did you do this without having the protection of or the underwriting of, you know. Now, I've worked in a lot of colleges and universities you know, or, and around, you know, <laughs> different groups of all mm -hmm. kinds. Uh, but not under their auspices, you know, yeah. not, I mean, you know what I mean when I say Yeah, that. absolutely. That's left you free to, like you've indicated throughout, and that is to follow your heart and your intuition and do the work that you're called to do. Yes, and I have to say this, that, that if someone chooses that, they have to be willing to take risk and they have to be willing to trust spirit. There's no way to be a little bit pregnant on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and they're really in. Yeah. That's a good point. And, and it is, uh, you know, it's like you, you're, you're describing also not just the creator journey um, or the spiritual teacher journey, but also the, uh, the entrepreneur journey. Um, and that is, you know, you, you take the leap of faith and, and then, but at the same time, each day you might awaken with the, your, the first cortisol of your stress hormone of the morning, questioning yourself, doubting and having fears, like, am I really doing the right thing? You know, but then you get into the work and into the flow and it works mm -hmm. itself out because you know you're in, in alignment with purpose. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny thing about some of my mind that um, I remember one time um, in, a, in a meditation vision, I was on a, a mountain and I was sort of walked, as it were, to the edge and I looked down and everywhere I looked, there were spears of mountains sticking up. Mm -hmm. And I was told to jump. Mm -hmm. And when I looked, it was like, I'm going to get speared if I jump, you know, as to who jump anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And as I did, I fell through all of those spears. And it became really clear to me, even on the way down, these were never real. I made them up in my mind. Yeah. They were all fantasy fears. And I think they're ghost mountains. And, and this is what we do to ourselves sometimes and i think that people do that in institutions and they inhibit often the very creative 
people that they fired because they're afraid that it might not pass muster for this reason or the other. It gets amped up if you're working on your own. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, the, the very have, last part I missed. It, it, gets, it, it gets amped up, that quality. Amped up. amped up. If you're working on your own. So you have to be willing to say yes. that I'm willing to have risk as being part of it, which means you can't, you have to really trust spirit. You really have to trust your spirit yes. you know, and your place in the universe. And that does include c confronting any places in you that have to be cleaned up. You can't teach love and then turn around and act out of love, out of fear. Yes. You know, yeah. that doesn't wash, <laughs> make right. crazy. Yeah, definitely. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the people who come to you for counseling, um, for your workshops, you know, what are you seeing people primarily seeking, looking for? And I'm asking that also in case any in our audience, you know, then they'll know like the kind of people that you t tend to attract or that you serve most, like how would, how would they, um, and what would be the process of them coming to you, signing up for workshops? They can do that on your oh, website. It, yeah. They can, you know, sign up for your workshop. Because I, I really, you know, th they cover the waterfront in terms of professions and stuff. Yes. Uh, so that that would be impossible to sum up. Right. right. <laughs> you know, um, They're humans. <laughs> and this meeting as well, because, you know, um, we inherited in our Western tradition a lot of um, hierarchical models, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, competition is one of the things that we're retiring if we go to a more universal understanding of things so that you know if if i were to say to you well most of my clients are educated it would be a fact but that's also could be very misleading sure educated with what you know yeah. five phds does not guarantee that you're a conscious person or happy you know, <laughs> you know what i'm saying yes so, absolutely uh yeah if i'm saying it well i mean yes yeah so um well, i guess sorry go ahead I was just going to say, if someone is interested in, in coming to my work, they would contact my office and they would, for a session, a one on one session, they'd be put on a waiting list. And um, when I'm teaching classes, they are posted on my website. Um, I'm not teaching right this minute because of the new book, mm -hmm. but that will change as soon as, as I have that first draft. Right. Done. <laughs> and I guess part of what I'm wondering too is like, for instance, with, and the creators in our audience and communities that we, that mm -hmm. we serve and, and work with um, and learn from, um, there are a lot of, there are at least our top five common or top three common dilemmas or struggles. Um, so do you have, is there any commonality amongst people who come to you and say, first, I need help with, and then fill in the blank. Is there any kind of commonality or is that as diverse as well? Mm. Well, that, that that's a little of a tough question, but if I but what comes to my mind is to say that um, generally speaking, I don't think people seek out my work that are trying to figure out what a chakra is. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, are 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 going through their first book or two. Um, and so by the time they are working with me, they very often are struggling really with um, how to be conscious in their relationships, how to be conscious at work, like say they're in an executive position and they know all these things and they, they, they really believe deeply in, in, in what they're here to do and they are having to do it in a, as we all are mm -hmm. in an environment that's not necessarily in sync right. with that. And so how do they teach that, empower their people, um, live these love values, live the truth of themselves in that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are finishing up a lot of karma now. So there are a lot of relationship issues that show up. Yeah. You know? um, people are always interested, of course, in, in their, um, how do I take the next step spiritually for me? And that's very tailored to that and to every individual. There's not you know, can't sum that up. True, definitely. Well, uh, no, but that, that question in and of itself is a good one. It's like, how do I become more, how do I integrate my spiritual life and my, with my everyday life? How do I become? Oh, that's you know, probably the overriding thing. Yeah, right there. 
that makes all sense. It's just in that sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this we're nearing the end of the hour that we are like actually just just past the hour that I promised. Oh. You would <laughs> go. Yeah, I didn't hear your bird this time. <laughs> Oh, wait, it's the half hour. We're on the half hour, but we've been recording for an hour. Um, so is there anything else you would like to share with our audience before you go? And I would like to say, too, hopefully we can do this again when your new book is out. Sure. Oh, well, thank you. I would love to do that. Yeah, I guess the thing that I would say to people most of all is really to trust themselves, to really find whatever thing helps them to know who they are. You know, that's the most important thing. And then they about the business of the of declaring their intention to live that okay. because everything starts with intention. And when they do that, they can start attracting to themselves everything that's needed, you know, Yes. and to okay. believe in that, to really believe in themselves. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much. Gloria. Thank you. Thank you. Laura. I really enjoyed being with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, we'll be in touch. Okay. Great. Bye now. Blessings. Blessings. <laughs>